nights on the Thames embankment being homeless, said, the innocent moon that does nothing but shine moves all the laboring surges of the world. That's poetry. Mm -hmm. Thompson understood, he was no scientist, but he understood the power of the tides. He lived on the Thames, so people by the coast know that. People inland, they wouldn't know what a tide table was or what they are supposed to do with it. But if you are on the wrong side of the tidal wave, as you know, it is ruined. So there's a cyclical pattern. The phases of the moon, the tides that go with them, and how that affects having a maritime life. But to get the proof really in back of us, we have to go up river for a little bit and go to Vienna. I know the pastry's overpriced. <laughs> And the opera is very loud. It's a lot of yelling over the music in languages that no one understands. Yes, I know there's more to offer, but if it moves, satirize it. If it doesn't move, satirize it. And everything uh, comes out uh, fairly even. But toward the beginning of the 20th century, there were a couple of unusual people in Vienna, one of whom we're going to make fun of, and one of whom we're going to enlist in our army. And in order to do that properly, we need to quote a fictional person. Well, that's not all the time. Sherlock Holmes is so frequently quoted, and a lot of characters in Dickens are. So there's a fair amount of extrajudicial precedent for it. So we're going to quote the famous forensic scientist, Dr. Temperance Brennan from the show Bones. And you know that she said, psychiatry is bunk. <laughs> Now, you know that all universal generalizations are false, including this one. So we, but we have to cut her a little slack. She is, she is a brilliant scientist. And so we might say, much psychiatry is bunk. And we enlist as exhibit number one, Dr. Sigmund Freud, a man with a very, very dirty mind, <laughs> I think you have to admit. He, he seemed to believe that uh, young men wanted to murder their fathers and marry their mothers. So here's what he submits as evidence from literature. He, he submits, first of all, Sophocles' Oedipus Rex. The real moral of that play is, as most of you know, don't mess with what the oracle has to say. You can't get around it. You can't finesse the oracle. Because Oedipus didn't know he was killing his father because he was put out to foster care and had no idea that he was heir to the throne. And he didn't know it was his mother he was marrying. But where he went wrong and where it was a Greek tragedy was that it was revealed that he had ignored the prophecies of the oracle. And that was actually his downfall. Well, we pointed that out to Uncle Sigmund. And he goes on to Hamlet, figuring Shakespeare knows what he's talking about. So Freud claims that uh, Hamlet is obsessed with his mother. Well, he's obsessed with the fact that his mother arranged the killing of his father and married his nasty uncle. That was really what was bothering him. And once again, we had to have someone stop and try to explain that to Dr. Freud. But Dr. Freud's chief competitor was not really a psychiatrist, but he also studied literature and mythology extensively, and he rose above some of these limitations of psychiatry as bunk. So we'll enlist Dr. Carl Jung in our army, and what Jung realized from examining various cultures is that sure, there are lots of cultures that are interlocked, and a lot of the mythology and folklore and patterns in nature and in history that are so widespread that they're observable by just about uh, every culture. The connections are there. You can't tell how one influenced the other. But he also identifies numerous cultures in which they could possibly have no connection with one another. And he finds that there are various cyclical patterns in nature and other places in reality that had to have 
a subconscious influence, and maybe later a conscious influence, upon various tribes, various city-states, various parts of early humanity that did not have influence on one another. So there's not a causal link. There's not a cultural contamination. And almost all of these archetypal patterns, as he named them, are linked to the coast, to the sea, to the patterns that go on if you have a seafaring life. And you can scarcely turn over a piece of literature, a major myth, without finding that these archetypal patterns show you that the people who went to sea, the people who lived by the sea, were influenced. Their success, their failure, depended upon their perception and their ability to work with these cyclical patterns through reality. Some of them are so simple, so straightforward, that's the archetype of the journey. <clears throat> why you are on the journey, why you are able to complete it or not to complete it, of course, varies with every fable, with every myth, with every piece of literature, oh, no, although not entirely, they overlap, they replicate uh, one another. Sometimes the journey is, as you know, a means of conquering your limitations, of proving your personhood, of proving your fitness for success, for being a leader. And very often, the person who is going on the journey to prove himself is representative of his nation or race. He is the noble hero. He becomes the eponym. His country eventually is named after him. Or he is so central to the literature and legends of his country, he keeps reappearing. Those of us who have links to English-speaking culture, you've already thought of King Arthur. And from the 5th or 6th century onward, he's there in all sorts of literary forms. And then he gets brought back because the cyclical patterns repeat themselves through different eras. There are lots of people who had a wonderful uh, career in their specialties because Alfred Lord Tennyson brought the Arthurian legends back in the 1800s. Was it Tuesday afternoon? He used to go read his works to Queen Victoria, and that in itself was an endorsement. You can go to Bradbury and Bradbury wallpapers in the Bay Area today and get a 48 in inch repeat, good for hallways and staircases, of the lion and the dove. William Morris figured out, I can make money off of Tennyson and still produce a wonderful piece of art to brighten people's homes. And that's exactly what he did. So King Arthur's back. And then you get these cheap knockoffs like Tolkien, <laughs> Sorry, didn't mean to spoil your evening by, uh, by mentioning him, but that is locale Arthurian legend. Let's face it, you're not going to get anything but uh, honesty from this speaker. And so every epic poem ever written, whether it's Roland or Beowulf or Gawain and the, Grand, and the Green Knight and, and even ones that have been universalized through uh, Christianity, Milton's Paradise Lost, they're all the noble hero and the ability to conquer hardships and enemies. And they, they wind up on some sort of journey. The Crusades liberate Jerusalem from the so-called infidels. But it is uh, all part of that noble hero and the journey to prove oneself. Sometimes it's a journey of guilt. It's a journey of expiation, of removing the sin that has stained you and the effect that you have had on others. And while Keats was saying, I stood tiptoe upon a little hill, the air was cooling and so very still. Coleridge, admittedly having a bit of opium, was out in his um, sedan chair under the lime tree. He has that 
nice little poem on the lime tree bow or my prison while uh, Shelley's and Wordsworth and so on were out on the lake having, uh, having a picnic upon the waters and Coleridge is there writing uh, Kubla Khan. But he also, of course, as you know, despite the fact that he didn't have a great deal of experience with the sea, he produced The Ancient Mariner, one of the finest poems about guilt and expiation. Coleridge was not known as a particularly religious person, yet he gives us the image of the ancient mariner having shot the albatross. And as you can realize, when rigor mortis sets in for the albatross, it greatly resembles the cross. And so Coleridge says, as the ancient mariner say, instead of the cross, the albatross about my neck was hung. The ancient mariner is re relieved of his guilt. <coughs> Water is available again to the sailors, and they are saved along with the ancient mariner. So, they, so the Christian adaptation of the archetype is there as, uh, as well. But you can go back pretty far for the uh, exile, uh, the archetype of exile and return to set in. In fact, in terms of eponyms, it's not just the sirens who had the capital letter taken away from them. Arguably one of the most famous heroes in classical literature, Odysseus, became an eponym that we don't even in most cases, think about him specifically when we use the word Odyssey as a symbol, a synonym for any kind of journey, even a quotidian, an ordinary uh, one, but also a noble one. But it was the committee, the multi-generational committee that is now referred to as Homer, you know, there may have been a historical Homer at some point, but now he has become a name for several generations of poets who carried down the oral tradition of the Trojan War. And of course, since the Greeks are on the winning side, and then you get these oddities, I'll just interpolate that digression, of the Romans. The Romans did wonderful things. Look at those aqueducts and Hadrian's Wall and some of those uh, very uh, talented and clever and venal emperors. But they were engineers, they weren't scientists, they were technicians, they were not original thinkers. Except that Virgil comes up with the bizarre idea of having someone who lost the war become a hero. So here is Aeneas fleeing with his dad on his back from the burning city of Troy, and he goes on to found Rome, even though the letter L is engraved in his biography. I don't mention that to too many uh, people of Italian descent. They get a little excitable. They, they don't want an Englishman uh, claiming that their society was founded as losers. But I say, go, go read Virgil. He's one of, he's one of your own. Uh, I, uh, don't shoot the messenger. You can't count on various excitable people not shooting the messenger. But anyway, Odysseus, on the winning side, even though some of you might say, well, it's only the Mediterranean. Well, the, the Mediterranean was pretty significant to the ancient world. So Odysseus gets detained in various places, as you know, even if you read a summary of the uh, Odyssey. Uh, Circe, who as a minor goddess, was often in a bad mood. She turns his men into pigs apparently some sort of semiotic proto-feminist statement <laughs> going on there, but he, he escapes. And then he gets to some other interesting places, <coughs> such as Malta. Yes, he got to that little outpost of the European Union somewhat uh, early. And we can prove that. Because if you've ever wondered, did Jacques Cousteau like reggae music? <laughs> Well, no, but his ship is named Calypso. Yes, well, he bought it from the government of Malta when they updated 
their ferry system going from the main island to the secondary island of Gozo. And it is on Gozo if you've been to Malta. And if you haven't, why haven't you? You really love it. Yes. Uh, so on Gozo, the second island of Malta is Calypso's Cave of the Winds, where Odysseus spent a little vacation time before he got home to uh, Penelope. So Jack Rousseau probably didn't have time to rename the ship. And that's why it has remained the uh, Calypso. So you, you even get the terminally obscure here uh, as, as part of one of the uh, digressions. So Odysseus does eventually return home. But it isn't, departing a little bit from things maritime, it isn't only the world of which we believe ourselves to be a part that the cyclical archetypal patterns hold true. There's even a branch of the study of mythology called Chthonic myth. I know, sounds like a dry, dull, scholarly term. It actually means something exciting once it gets into literature. These are stories, Ovid's Metamorphoses is full of them, some other places, where the above ground world and the underworld are involved in various sorts of paired narrative threads. And that uh, in the pre-Christian afterlife, it was technically possible, if you knew the right people, to get back from below ground and out of the grip of the god Hades, who sounds far more dignified before, the, you know, the Romans also renamed all the Greek gods, completely unnecessary waste of time, so Hades became Pluto, and then Walt Disney spoiled all of that, <laughs> as we, we know. Uh, but you know some of these uh, myths. But Rossetti's famous painting of Jane Burden Morris, you know the Morrises and Rossetti have a, a little arrangement. We, you've read the Gossip Columnist. Anyway, one of the most beautiful of the Free Raphaelite paintings is Jane Morris as Persephone holding the pomegranate, the key to her, the deal where she spent six months every year in the underworld and six months ago graph Arch archetypal pattern cycle of the season very easy or in a simple matter the arrangement that Orpheus got to rescue his girlfriend Eurydice from the grips of the underworld and he of course disobeys instructions he can't help it he was told don't look back to see if she's following you or the deal is off. Naturally, you know what he did, and poof, she disappears. And when she got back to the Hades, she said what so many people have said ever since, why did I ever have a musician for a boyfriend? <laughs> exactly, yes. But, uh, and even in the Christian era, that unusual little arrangement that Dante made with Virgil that he could get a tour of all three important parts of the afterlife of, of hell, purgatory, and heaven. Hell being by far the most interesting. And death is seen in the, in the Christian era as so final, and especially being condemned to hell for all eternity, that Dante gets some really incredulous looks as he's getting a complete tour of all of the circles of hell from his tour guide Virgil. And he gets to uh, Circle 8, Bolger 1, as you all remember, and there are the evil counselors. My future, I know, for having been both an intercollegiate debate coach and a political consultant, if those two <laughs> don't add up to evil counselor. I don't know what is, but there is Guido the Cavalcante, like all the other evil counselors, wrapped in a moving tongue of flame. And Guido, like other inhabitants of hell, can tell a living person how, I don't know, Dante's supposed to explain this in the narrative. And he, he cannot really believe it. He recognizes Virgil as one of the virtuous pagans. But so he greets Dante and he says to Dante, T.S. Eliot used this portion, this uh, section, as the epigraph for the wasteland. And uh, the, the Guido says, here translating from the medieval Italian, 
if I believed that my reply were ever made to one who could climb to that world again, this one